do you use to describe the general state of, of the world? I mean, in terms of social, mm -hmm. environmental, political, whatever, whatever way you're bent. Right. Uh, well, actually, um, you might like to know that I almost died twice in 2001 and 2004 with asthma and heart attacks. So when somebody asks me, what's the state of the world, I think as is. Because I think uh, the problems we have now are universally the problems we've always had. The technology has changed the dimensions of those problems. But the solutions are the same. And the solutions have to do with our humanity, the things that matter to people who are good and decent people. And beyond that, I think we still have to keep working at it. So how do we access that part of ourselves, that humanity part? It seems that uh, uh, in a general sense, it's difficult for our species to, to have that be our, our deciding factor in our decision making. Yeah, I think as individuals, uh, many people have access, and I think this is where my faith in humanity is. Uh, most people uh, are good and decent people, or do their best to be that way. And then there are exceptional circumstances where in a crowd we lose that contact or in a kind of mob dispersal of propaganda and uh, demonizing others, we lose faith in that part of us that could connect. So we build walls instead of bridges. But I think there are enough of us uh, saying in our way, in our art, in our music, in our songs, uh, think again imagine uh, how we can make contact. Let's remember to work at that. And then some take chances and remind me the world is worth saving. Well, how would you describe the forces at play in the world? You're saying that there's many people who seem to have a, a sense of uh, humanity, but it seems that the forces that are running the planet do not have that same sense. How would you describe the, 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 the forces at work? Well, I think the forces at work are, are distorted by technology and the speed with which we get information, and the even more uh, lightning speed with which we're influenced before we're conscious of that influence. So it's a matter now of um, educating ourselves to understand what's happening. I think that's the first step, rather than being the victim of it. Um, I think the forces at play today are more chaotic for most people because of the lack of education. We don't know exactly what the consequences are when we're so immediately affected by information that comes pouring down at all directions. And also I think uh, we have a distorted idea of who is demonizing who and how we fall into those propaganda traps. All right, so far so good. I think this was meant. <laughs> Try me again. So the forces at, at play here, why, why, why are we in a position where our survival is at, is at risk? For such an intelligent species, why is it that we are doing everything yeah. to, to... Well, I think we're, the forces at play now that are demonizing human nature and in fact, creating an influence that we don't quite yet understand, we're beyond McLuhan now, I think, um, are the forces that, that control the media, uh, that distort the truth, that uh, go for the emotional uh, propaganda that wins people over, but not their hearts or their minds, but their attitude. And so with attitude alone, we're not thinking. And I think what happens is we allow people to get away with things because many of us feel if we have to do anything about it, we have to know so much and it's beyond our knowledge to do anything. But in order to stop what's wrong or what's evil, I think it's not that difficult. It creates harm, uh, these forces, and when we see that harm, we have to shout, this is harmful we have to shout, this has to be stopped, or we have to examine what we're doing if we're doing it with some real innocence, you know, profit over thought, profit over um, 
anything that might take time to slow it down. And it's not only profit, it's power. There's a struggle for power between great nations and small. And people are just catching on. Uh, we belong more to each other than to any nation. But you can't know that unless you have a world perspective. I have hope because I think the media is presenting the world perspective to more and more people simply because of the technology and that it's available more freely because not every dictator can, you know, block the electronic waves. So something is happening. I, I really feel that um, the revolution we're headed for is a spiritual one. Not necessarily obvious for this generation to understand, but I think it's happening. And obvious to few, a few and many who have felt it, but haven't been able to articulate it. So when people are, you know, occupying places and they seem to be not hopeless or helpless, but unable to articulate what they are battling, it's a beginning, and it's a beginning that will matter. You just sort of went into my next question, which was, which was if the solution is a, an intellectual one or a spiritual one. So how, how, in, in your case, having experienced death in, in all religions or, or spiritual practices, mm -hmm. suffering is a great honer yes. of, of attention. And, and of course, death is the ultimate perspective. So how would you say that, that your perspective of life and of living has shifted before and after? I want to use the word, what is spiritual, very carefully, because I don't understand what is spiritual. I sense that's the word that helps me describe something that is still inexplicable to me, but very powerfully present. And I'm not talking about ghosts or hauntings or miracles. I'm talking about the very fact that human beings have a particular knack for empathy, for putting themselves in the place of others who are suffering. And sometimes in their own suffering, they are going to transcend that moment where they now know they are not alone. So that gives me hope that there is something spiritual, though I can't articulate it, uh, beyond that sense of it being there as a powerful force. It's also a word that can be clearly distorted because when people are convinced that their spiritual insight or definition, their religion, uh, gives them that righteous feeling that they can demonize others who think differently, I think that's a form of distortion that is dangerous. And in fact, I think above all else, that distortion is harming everybody because it prevents education, it prevents people from respecting other people's point of view, never mind their religious beliefs. I don't believe we're, we've evolved enough to have any firm belief that is so righteous that you know it's the only one possible. Uh, and if you think so, I think you better wake up. You're dangerous. You're dangerous to your own way of thinking because you won't broaden your thinking. You're dangerous to others because you will raise children and if you have power, you will take that power and use it in a spiritually narrow uh, way so that it becomes a weapon rather than a tool for opening up others to understand. Fundamentalism is one of the demons that I know for sure endangers all of us. And, uh, you know, the devil, as they have often said, and I have witnessed, the devil often takes the form of righteousness. I mean, what allows some people to think they can bomb a building or massacre children or, um, you know, uh, hide behind masks of deceit, if not that sense of righteousness, that they are right and therefore they should be allowed to do any of it and all of it to prove their rightness. And that's an endless battle. And I think uh, if somebody feels righteous, I hope they look at themselves uh, in the way that a hundred years from now, people will look at them and say, what were they thinking? Never mind, what were they believing? 
One thing I want to bring up in regards to, to spiritual that you sort of mentioned. Uh, some people call it the zone. Some people call it med- meditation. Mm-hmm. Some people call it that's, that's where s- the spiritual realm takes place, that place of, of inner quiet. Do you access such a, such a place? Do, do you have an understanding of that space of, of emptiness? I have studied Zen in my own independent way and discovered that there is a place of quietness that is a gift that comes upon one sometimes. Um, But I've never intentionally found a way to access it whenever I wanted it or demanded it or wished for it. So I just wonder if uh, it's a matter of a state of being and it's a biochemical matter as well as what may be the mysterious part of it all of the ultimate mystery. Why do we have access to something like that at all? Suggests that there must be, in this logical thinking, uh, in my logical thinking, there must be something greater that can be accessed. But we've only evolved to a certain stage. And I think anybody who thinks they have full command of it, and also that they can give it to others, or that they can um, I guess, call it up at will, maybe creating an illusion about that, rather than actually um, reaching that zone. I think if you're too comfortable in a zone like that, then you've forgotten that it's a mystery. And without that mystery, I don't think there's enough humility to deal with um, what might be going on. I'm going to be sure to ask the Rinpoche on Tuesday the same. I think so. Yes. I'm curious to know what they said (laughs) because I guess for them it's a lifetime of discipline to to uh, to reach such a state, Mm -hmm. and supposedly it's a state of ultimate humility. So I guess we'll find out. Well, you know, I'm I'm a bit cynical about that. When anybody says they've reached an ultimate state of humility, the very fact that they said it, I would say no, not yet. You know, it's what often. People say about the Zen moment, if you think you know it, then you don't. And if you think you're there, you aren't. And I kind of understand that, because it's it's part of the mystery that it has no beginning or an end, and I only sense the logic of that. I haven't felt that. But there are moments when I feel um, more in harmony with... Uh, things outside of myself than I usually am, and I suspect that that's a movement towards that potential. But I wouldn't claim I understood it entirely or have, in fact, been given the ultimate gift of ultimate humility. I think I'm very far from that. So when you're, in your, when you're creating and when you're writing, uh, would you say that's an intellectual exercise, or is it something else? I think it's a combination. Uh, you know, the word intellectual suggests that there's a, there's a cage of thinking and words that you are in at the moment. And then when somebody says they're in an emotional state, it's a separate thing from that, etc. I think when you're in harmony, the ultimate suggestion I sense happening to me, and I say suggestion because even if I'm using words to describe it, it's also escaping me. Uh, but all I can say is, um, it's a beautiful mystery. And if we're fortunate enough to experience some of that mystery, that says to us that we're on the road to evolving to something better and greater than we presently know, that we presently can ever know at this stage. There may be beings who can. They may be creatures in the sea. And there may be, may be two or three human beings. But I'm always suspicious of the declaration of that fact, that they have it or they're there, or that uh, we can understand it completely. So those moments of inspiration for you, when you're writing and and there's a flow there, I mean, every creative person, I think, experiences that when I was doing music or or Mm -hmm. any other creative thing, you just, all of a sudden... You're usually called the zone. That's right, the zone. Mm -hmm. So, So how would you describe that state of being? It's a sudden uh, surrender of any idea I have about what I was going to write or what I was going to do or how the character was going to behave. And it's not so much a surrender as suddenly I don't feel it's necessary to think about it. 
it's the activity of creating it that comes full force. And the character in this, in the case of my own writing, the character is creating itself. It's that odd feeling, it's a paradox. I remember Richard Ford, um, I mean, he writes what he does and extremely well, but he claimed that anybody who says that the character takes over and all this stuff is, is a form of a bullshit. Well, um, I have to tell Mr. Ford that for him it may very well be, but one artist should not tell another artist how they create, nor judge how they do it. If they're successful, I would say keep going. Do whatever it takes. If that's what you feel is important to you to do, do the art your way. I always find it odd when somebody makes that claim that for, for the whole species, right? Oh, yes. Because they don't expect oh, yes. it. Nobody does. Yeah, right? yeah. So, um, so there's a, there's a, I would like to sort of focus on that a bit. Do, mm -hmm. do you feel that those experiences in other aspects of your life ever? That, that same sense where everything is just flowing? Not everything is flowing, but you're in the flow. And that's all I can say from my own experience, that suddenly um, there is a conscious part observing it for a moment before you fall completely into it and surrender to it, where you go, oh, it's happening. And um, then suddenly you're there, you know. Now, if you're happening and you're saying, now, how is this happening? It's gone. Darn. <laughs> so that's what, uh, how it works with me. So that's a form of meditation, is it not? You know, ultimately, meditation should be doing the dishes, from what I understand. Mm -hmm. How is that meditation? Meditation mm -hmm. should be right now, as you, how you're sitting, mm -hmm. how you're thinking, how, how we're doing the dishes, how we're mm -hmm. walking down the street. Well, that's the definition of meditation. Um, to me, the word com is like the word spiritual. I, it's completely open-ended to me. If somebody believes they're meditating, they're meditating. And if somebody doesn't think they're meditating, but I think so, they're meditating. I think we have exclusive um, access to, that, to those definitions and we live them as we understand them. So I never, I don't say never, that's a big word, isn't it? I, I try not to argue definitions as long as I don't think they're completely insane or absurd. Because usually when you listen to someone's very thoughtful explanation, whether it's the Dalai Lama, or whether it's uh, somebody who's in a church pew discovering some harmony, I just believe what they're saying, and I believe it's true for them. And sometimes it reflects how I feel, but it's not consistently true for how I feel. There's different states and different kinds and different degrees and different depths of meditation. If I use that word, I wouldn't dare use it and then try and define it. Yeah, I find that too when I'm talking with people. It's always good to have a dictionary around, just so we have a, 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 a yeah. frame of reference that we both can yeah. adjust to. Yeah, but the frame, frame of references bother me too when people have a frame, frame of We're going to talk about this issue and here's our frame of reference. Uh, it's a box. Because if you're inspiring each other enough, hopefully, there's nobody there so logical, so cold-blooded as to say, we should stop now, we're out of the box. I have seen that happen. I have seen people who feel some religious ritual should only cause a certain reaction, only cause us to behave a certain way. And some people drift into another reality, which is true for them. Um, but obviously absurd for the leader or threatening, and so you're stopped because we had a frame of reference for this behavior. We had a ritual for this belief. We had a feeling that we approve of for what we're trying to achieve. And those are all kinds of fertilizer for what might happen. And uh, to transcend what might happen, I think you have to be fertilized by a lot of bullshit and then transcend it. And I don't mean bullshit in the bad way either, because I now know that some of the things I were taught, I had to have an understanding of to get the craft. 
and then be free of that understanding so that the craft takes me of its own power to someplace else. <clears throat> but people who are only technicians don't always get that, especially spiritual technicians. Like fundamentalists? Like fundamentalists and like those whose education is lacking and they don't know it. Do you think that people do have free will and purpose? I think people sense there might be a direction they would prefer over other directions. And if they're overeducated, then they just have the ones that you've educated them into, and they don't have choice, really, although they get the ten choices that the university course approves, or the religious program approves. Um, I find purpose a very tricky word because if you're a perfectionist, part of the illness of being a perfectionist is that the purpose has a very narrow road. And however it's pitched to a certain level of achievement, it's never going to be in harmony with the un unachievable. And I think when people arrive at a real state of um, who they are, and how they perceive their place, I guess, in the universe, they have to accept the unachievable as part of that place. Isn't, so That's kind of the paradox, isn't it? Is that, in a way, perfectionism is, is focus. Mm -hmm. Focus is narrow. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you have to also be open to the abstract, the concept of, 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 of abstract. Yeah, the, I think the purpose of anything that, that directs you to a, a greater and more richer life is to have a purpose that is completely open at the same time. That anything new comes in and the purpose will adjust and revise and be reborn. And the idea of re a purpose being reborn is a powerful concept for me. Uh, when I almost died twice, I did come back and understood, the, understood that there was always going to be this question, why? Why didn't I simply surrender to that darkness or ease into that sleep? The drugs were wonderful. Um, and I preferred not to. In fact, I made specific choices when I was semi-conscious that I think I would like to see what happens next. And the only next I knew was to come back to life, was to be alive. And especially as the friends of my, um, my family friends, I call them, uh, were there and calling me back and also uh, life was very interesting still, very interesting to me as it is now. And these questions of spirituality and all that, I, I'm not religious, I don't believe that there's a hereafter because I simply don't believe in beliefs about things we don't understand. But at the same time, I have a sense that when each of us dies, whatever our beliefs, if there is something, I think we're going to be equally surprised. I'm willing to be surprised. You experienced a, a closer degree of death than most people do. Uh, I don't know if you actually died or if you're great at the... At well, when you have a quadruple bypass, they actually stop the heart and everything, and then I... Um, when I was having the asthma and heart attack, it was a it was a dual trauma. It was a tricky business. Uh, they suggested to me that I had died a few times and they revived me. Simply because the heart stopped and all this. I don't think that the brain entirely stopped. I don't think they had time to find out about that except to bring me back and have the heart going and then see if there's any damage. In fact, they did a lot of observation when I came back because I had to, that first time, learn how to walk and talk and do a whole bunch of things because of the muscle memory. I was two months in the hospital and, you know, 11 days in the ICU ward under semi-conscious and unconscious states. So, um, but I drifted in and out and I wrote about it in my book, Not Yet, how I heard things and could play a game with that consciousness. Um, in fact, I, sometimes I said, you're a writer, pay attention. And then I played games like thinking, oh, wonder what dying is like. 
and I was waiting for the moron and the moron and the Mormon Tabernacle Choir, whichever one should come first. I had, a, I mean, I guess I have a good sense of humor about panic moments. In that case, again, the drugs were wonderful. And the sense of being loved and cared for in that hospital ward and with my friends speaking to me, um, I just was comforted. I wasn't that afraid. And then when I knew I could be so tired that I could surrender, I thought, no, no, come back. It's too interesting. I still want to find out what happens next in life, never mind what happens if one sleeps forever. So how has your perspective changed of the outside world? That's an interesting thing. I, when I wrote the book, Not Yet, one of the, uh, I think some critic on the radio or something, complained that the book didn't go anywhere, that he almost died, he comes back and life is the same, but they missed my point. As I was writing it, I was writing it at a level which, thank God, enough people got it, that you don't have to change because of that experience. But what happens is, what you have felt before, what you took for granted, what you treasured, when you come back like that, things deepen. We never think of deepening as a powerful force of being, but deepening is everything. To me, if this is the only life, deepening is where life exists and where, in fact, you might get a suggestion that there will be more. Seems to me that's that's your experience because maybe you're on the right, you're on a road that was that just needed to be deepened. Maybe some people mm -hmm. that experience would do a total shift because they needed that. Yeah, sometimes you get smartened up. Sometimes uh, some people come back and say why, and in fact commit suicide. I mean, I I started to study in writing my book why did my experience seem to be this way as compared to other people. And some people, you know, changed their life. They were changed forever. But I was quite content and happy with who I was. I'm a gay man, I'm a writer, I'm a teacher, I love what I do. I have uh, adopted families and families have adopted me and friends are family. I couldn't ask for more except let's have more of it as I knew it, you know. And if it's going to be better hereafter, hey, I'm willing to be surprised. But I think I think of uh, June Callwood who was asked when she was in a terminal state, if there was a life hereafter, and she and both Carol Shields had the same idea. Carol Shields was my writing teacher. And they both answered the uh, interviewer, Eleanor Watau, to the question, do you think there's a hereafter? One of the answers was, no, 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 this is it. This is enough. Don't people get it? This is miracle enough. And the other was, well, I don't know, but here's what I have to finish it, and here's what I have to do, and I'm writing a poem and, and starting a novel and that's kind of my attitude at the moment. One other word that is a very powerful word that people throw out a lot that has all sorts of meanings is love. Mm -hmm. And uh, I personally I like to stay away from that word because it's almost like a spiritual, mm -hmm. that, yeah. you know, what, is, what does somebody mean by that? I know what I mean by that. Mm -hmm. um, what do you mean by that? You know, people use the love, the word spiritual and a few other words like that, and they often want to define it or box it or suggest what it probably is, certainly for them as they experience it. But I think that's a mistake, like defining spiritual or what is a true religion, etc. Uh, because I think it's a feeling, and it's a feeling as one matures that should deepen and broaden who we are and how we are in harmony or are moving towards harmony with others. But I don't think it can be defined. And then you have to be careful that when you say you're in love with someone, that you're not in lust with someone. Because we, you know, sometimes mistake sexuality for sensuality. And so we think sensual and sexual are the same, so both are equally dirty or both are equally desirable. But one deepens and the other is the physical experience. Probably it helps in encouraging having children. Uh, and I think love should encourage that we relate to each other in a more gentle and kind way, or at least in a more thoughtful way. 
But that isn't love. Love is then what you are feeling. And the more it deepens, the less I think you can describe it other than to act on it, to act in your being, the, loving, uh, the lovingness that you feel. And to define it is to destroy it in the sense that you box it. Oh, I, I must care for you because I just gave you something. No, <laughs> many people give you something who don't like you. Uh, so I think um, you can only verify by that. But you know, it's a mystery, again the mystery. We now know from mapping the brain and so on, that that central part of where our feelings lie and where if you say friend or love or you think of family or, uh, or a puppy, you get all warm and all that kind of thing that we call loving. There are people who are uh, sociopaths, psychopaths, they don't have that feeling. So is it purely, simply a biological factor? And I've had this argument with people where they think they've got you. You see, it's biological and therefore when it's gone, it's gone. And I say, well, it may be biological, but I have a higher question to ask about that biological factor. Why is it there at all? And how sad that some people will not have it and will be dangerous to the rest of us. But why is it there at all? And if it's there for our survival, certainly if you have the quality of loving and the feelings of loving, the survival of the human race is more appropriate than if you have one without that feeling and you're willing to kill, stab, die, be a fundamentalist. So I kind of think there is a quality called love, but you better feel it and let me know by your acting that the feeling is there, not by your telling. Mm. So it seems to me that, that, uh, that this world is not run by love. Right? Humanity, humanity is a, you said you've been, in, you've been sort of uh, investigating mm -hmm. humanity with more depth for your latest book. And um, you're saying that basically, uh, a reflection of love is, is harmony, to be harmonious with your surroundings and with, your, with yourself, mm -hmm. I would imagine. And that's definitely not what we see. Right? That's not the experience of the species. Individuals within the species might feel that way. But as a species, we don't seem to have that, uh, that, that um, connectivity within, within the species. Would you, would you agree with that? And if, if, or what, what's your thoughts mm -hmm. on, on... No, I, I don't agree with that. I think the disharmony is caused by the lack of education and by the restrictions of a fundamentalist uh, militant power in governments and in religions and in narrow-minded people because, you see, even in, in, in a powerful militant state, there are soldiers who call each other brothers and are loving but they're loving in that box where anybody else that doesn't wear the same uniform, they're to kill or demonize. That's a problem of education. And being an educator, having been a teacher for 40 years and still teaching uh, in my way, not, not you know, as, as anything more than talking with people, um, I think it's a matter of education. And I'm not talking about you can change a psychopath or a sociopath because we now know it's a biological factor. But for the survival of the species, most of us have the elements to feel things. And we need to educate and raise people like that, ourselves included, in a nurturing environment where that can thrive. Where in fact it can thrive so well that a sociopath or a psychopath would probably prefer it because they will have the logic of, gee, this is better than doing that. Um, oh, no, no, no. I don't think we're a species that are divided. We are a dividing species when we are not educated, when we do not know that there are different forms of intelligence. And uh, the highest form of that intelligence must have to do with the the sense that directs us to harmony and to, to 
ideas of how we can love and belong to each other rather than attack each other. It's education. So what about, what's the difference between people that, that, that have that, that sense without even being surrounded by, by the opposite mm -hmm. and, and the, the people that seem to need to be led to that space, space or that perspective? Um, I, I would assume that you've probably been your, the way you've been all your life to some degree. Maybe it's, maybe it's deepened. But you probably, or I shouldn't say you probably have, but mm -hmm. maybe you've had this perspective. I know I've had that perspective all my life, but I know many people have had mm -hmm. it. So it, it's an interesting dichotomy that I find with this project, is that what, what's, what's the point of it? Is it just always going to be preaching to the converted? Or can you really educate somebody mm -hmm. into being something when they can just be educated into something else? In other words, mm -hmm. where, is the, where is real change? Like, how, you know, yeah. Where does real change take place? I think real change occurs. I'm very influenced by the work of Krishnamurti, the philosopher. He calls himself very carefully a philosopher. And I agree he is a philosopher. Uh, but his philosophy raises the level of discussion at a deeper level than ordinary materialistic philosophies. And I, I think when I mention education, I mean the education of the self, that every individual has to understand the qualities that are operating with themselves and that they have the right to express those qualities that are constructive and that are nurturing to others and to themselves. Where it goes wrong is, as in a militant state, as in a fundamentalist uh, group, you're instructed to narrow all of that potential to nurture only your righteousness and only uh, nurture it to demonize others so that you can attack and kill and destroy. And these people often live in so much fear. I mean, you speak to a fundamentalist who meets a group of free thinkers and they are locked in fear and hatred and, and an ugly sense of stereotyping everybody that's there who's not them. Where did it go wrong? I think they were miseducated. At some point when they needed somebody so badly, somebody came in a way that got them at their most vulnerable and then controlled how they should grow and narrowed them to this kind of self-hating, over-loving righteousness. I think people who are given a chance to be educated would prefer a true education over one that is a narrow, fundamentalist one. I can't see that you wouldn't choose a banquet table over a bowl of badly cooked porridge. It seems to me that we're heading down a path that's, that's pretty destructive. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you foresee the future of, of, our, of our species? I'm not a species freak, which means to say that if we're a particular species, we should be the ones that are surviving and should be dominating and should be conquering all, etc. We may be one form of a species moving on to a greater form. Please, can there not be a greater one? Um, so sometimes the species is self-destructive, sometimes nature comes in and, you know, uh, something comes out of, the, out of the sky and blows us up entirely, like as happened, I understand, to the dinosaurs. Um, I don't know, it's a miracle enough that we exist at this present stage and that there might be a future for the kinds of feelings that we've been able to understand and deepen because not because it's important but because it's interesting and it seems worthwhile that if we have the chance why not go as far as we can with the miracle that that does exist and um, do our best. I think that the adventure is worth it, even if there's no payoff. I like that. That's great. I, I agree with you. I totally agree with that, that, that there should be such pressure on us. Mm -hmm. that, 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 like you say, the miracle of being alive is pretty amazing, and, and who knows what we're here to do. I'm just going to readjust this a bit. Good.
Are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine. How's your back? It uh, it's okay. I just now that I hold my breath and then the pain. It, it's, oh. a, it's a shooting pain, kind of, really? if I move a certain way, but I'm fine. Yeah. You know, this is important to me, too, what you're bringing out from me. Oh, great. Good. Because Good. I don't know what I know till I say it. Yeah. <laughs> and then I go, oh, my God, did he say that? <clears throat> did you have something you want to say? You know, this, this project that I, I sense has such an uh, incredible dimension of possibilities. It can also be in danger in, in itself because it becomes a kind of preaching to the converted. I'm just hoping somebody accidentally turns on a section of anything that you've done so far and it blows their mind apart. And that's all we can do, you know. But then if they turn on the wrong section and only hear some of it, it can be problematic. As in everything that promises so much, there's always those who um, are entrapped by certain box thinking and only take enough to feed what guarantees their confidence and righteousness, but won't allow them to challenge themselves. And I hope anybody who hears any of us talk will say, well, I hadn't thought of that. Let me think of that. That's more important than to say, I agree, I agree. Because uh, I agree is the form of bullshit. There's nothing you can agree with. Nothing. Because it all comes to nothing. But I think what's important is you can think about something and continue to think and expand the levels you're thinking and deepen your feeling about that thinking. That's what I want this project to do. I wouldn't want it to be a tool for a fundamentalist of any kind. See, it'd be, it'd be interesting to publish a book with quotations from various people, you know, and photographs to evoke feelings related to that. Mm -hmm. So that prevents less fundamentalism, although I kind of think, no, it doesn't either, because I think of Hitler promoting the blonde, blue-eyed, whoever and whatever, in all that statuary and all that. Um, did anybody notice he himself wasn't blonde or blue-eyed? Did he anybody notice? Well, I don't, wouldn't want to say he wasn't German. That would be too shocking for that time, I mean, because certainly the German people have transcended those traps and those uh, boxes. Japan hasn't. Japan hasn't admitted anything. They still need to know what they're capable of so that they will be less liable to go there. I greatly admire what Germany has done as a, as a, as a unified people. Actually, when you, when you look at the fact that they were the, the people that resisted the, the, the Roman Empire, if you mm -hmm. go back that far, they were the, barbar the barbarians that never yes, got conquered. Yes, that's true. And, and they became actually the center of, of Western thought for quite, and uh, they've really pushed Western They had thought. the renaissance of art, of philosophy, of music, yeah. and you think, how can they go wrong? Well, they went wrong because somebody boxed them in and they all agreed to stay in the box, and anybody outside was the enemy. To me, this is something that I always find difficult. Nationalism is a form of fundamentalism at whatever level. At whatever level you're saying, I believe I'm this and here are the borders and here are the boundaries. And even though I'm a liberal Canadian, no, it's a fundamental state that you're in when you call yourself a Canadian. Uh, it's not the human state. We should not have boundaries in our thoughts about who we are. Now, for purposes of a passport and for self-protection, I'm willing to be a Canadian. And I'm proud that Canadians tend to be more open than others, as I see it anyways, and that's fundamental on my part because many Canadians aren't. At the same time, I know all kinds of nationalism at all levels are a form of fundamentalism. I love that Chinese statement, uh, 
that goes, happy is that country that needs no heroes. And I would rephrase that to, happy is that country. Happy are those people who need no boundaries. That's the civilization I want to belong to. That's the civilization, the civilization I'd like to belong to too. Mm -hmm. But as an anthropologist, as for me, I'm a for me, I view myself as a human anthropologist, and I yeah. see that there are by being male, I have certain, I have certain, oh yes, uh, biases. Yeah. By being in this border, it, there is just for whatever, however humans have done it, yeah. they've created little bubbles of of perspective, mm -hmm. and I was born in this bubble. I can transcend this bubble. But it does. It does provide. It does have. It does provide me with a, a perspective that I have to recognize, and then I can release mm -hmm. it. I think to some degree. Well, you know what I think. When people are born male or female, it is a box. And some people are fundamentally female, it's fundamentally male, etc. But I think when you discover, as you grow older, and it takes age, um, who you are as a human being and how other human beings are related to you, uh, and that education of that fact at the deepest level, it breaks apart gender boundaries and national borders and what we call the I, you know. Um, and I don't even believe in the we because we implies that there are borders there. I can't explain what it is that I feel so good about so much that's happening now, except that more people are feeling that there is more to have than to lock away and put away. What's your personal relationship to, to nature? How would you describe it? Well, you know, um, what's important to me in nature? Well, first of all, I have asthma. <laughs> and nature has been a kind of enemy sometimes when there's pollen and a blessing because oxygen is part of nature. So I always find it's a greater creation than I can possibly understand. And when I see those um, programs where a flower is unfolding or where they go with a, with a microscope into the deepest parts of the particles of an element, I think the mystery just deepens, and I don't worship nature in the way that, uh, you know, I'm a nature freak, but I am part of the process of growing, living, and dying, and changing. And I am a rock, and I am a river, and uh, hey, I just love the idea that I asked to be cremated, and the ashes will be part of a whole bunch of other stuff. Yeah, that's nature to me, and that's great. That's fine with me. What about the concept of wilderness? Do you find do you, do you feel that um, that it's just evolution that 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 it becomes it's becoming more of a human dominated world? Is that just the evolution mm -hmm. of the planet? The evolution of well, as a species that can change the planet, and as a species who technologically and scientifically have evolved to a state of uh, dangerous proportions of ignorant knowledge, you know, to know how to do something and not know its consequences, to me, uh, an ignorant knowledge that we're going through. It's not even innocent anymore. Sometimes we invent things that we know are dangerous and we go ahead because it makes a profit. Uh, and then we say, oh, somebody will solve that danger later. Well, it's a form of evil to think that way. But, um, let me hear your question again, because I think I want to isolate something here. The importance of the concept of, of wilderness. Mm -hmm. Not just of nature, but of wilderness. Yeah. Wilderness is in the eye of the beholder. Some people are born to be in the forest and are attuned to it as soon as they meet it, even if for the first time, and they were born in the city. And some are not. Uh, I tend to be a city person, and I respect the wilderness. I respect the fact that it's only wilderness because I don't understand it, because I don't know enough about it. So the wilderness is a danger to me. I don't climb mountains. They are not a friend to me. But if I climb them and adore the way, the height of something, or rather, 
gives me a, pers a perspective of my humanity, then it's because I'm educated about what a mountain is from climbing. I don't have those experiences. I'm willing to respect wilderness. And I imagine another, another thing that you mention a lot is mystery. Yes. And, and in, a, in a way, that's from, from my point of view, uh, wilderness represents mystery, a, 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 a physical mystery mm -hmm. on this planet that, yeah. that is not the same thing. Uh, there's a mystery to a city, for sure. Yeah. But it's a different kind of mystery. Even if I don't go to that wilderness, mm -hmm. that it's there. Well, I think, you know, if you mention wilderness, what we don't know about has always been a wilderness, some less threatening than others. But once we invented the microscope, once we invented mechanically and technically how to see things we could not otherwise see, the wilderness opened up into a wonderful kind of mystery, which is part of all mystery. So that's where I feel, you know, education is the education of the mysterious. And when people fall in love with a particular subject or object or a plant, it's just endless mystery that they're, they're, they're resolving. And yet it never solves ultimately the question, why is it there at all? And why are we here mysteriously wondering? Do you have a, an answer to that? Or another an answer yeah. to the uh, response? I don't have an answer about any mystery except that in living it and understanding there is a mystery is such a powerful way to be. And that to me is the answer to mystery. Be part of the mystery, respect it, nurture it, discover it, understand it. And keep going because it's endless. What, in your view, would be the best is the best possible way of surviving this point in time? There's so much pressures on, mm -hmm. on from every angle. Yeah, I think to survive this time where so many of us are under different kinds of pressures of work, of business, of health, of aging, of uh, the amount of knowledge that none of us can ever take in completely, uh, is to simply keep going, keep going. You know, uh, and then it you you will stop. It will stop. Just know that. So if keep going is the adventure, why not have more of it? And whether you like it or not, it will stop. But so much of it is still fun, and so much of it is still um, there's a wow factor in my life. And I just love momentary discoveries or rediscoveries. So I think, well, I can keep going. Yeah, I know there's an end, but why not keep going? I think I've been blessed because I've never been stopped by a trauma or a tragedy. Although, I mean, I've had physical traumas like my, my heart attacks and my asthma attacks. but. Um, I always feel badly for those who are castrated from their own adventure or, or traumatized from going forward. And that to me is just horrendous that we might do this to a child, you know, or a teacher fundamentally lock in somebody that had a greater potential and then use that locked in victim as a weapon to deliver bombs or bullets or whatever. Or poisoned ideas. Yeah, yeah. The toxicity, Poison. you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm sorry you didn't get to hear the, the talk I gave about at the um, multiculturalism because it, the thought came to me that one of the greatest dangers we have are what I call toxic certainties. And sometimes the toxic certainty takes the form of righteousness that this is who I am and this is my dignity and all this. And it's toxic because one day you must not be that who I am. And you have to break through and recognize that and drop it because it's become toxic to the way you're raising your children or the way you're teaching your school or the way you're governing a country. Part of the problem with people who are trapped in narrowness 
they need support for that narrowness. And the more they build the walls of support, the forts, the fortresses, the more they have soldiers guarding that narrowness, they're sure they're right. They're like a, a bullet headed towards you know, the heart of who they are. It's self-destructive. It's totally self-destructive. And I always worry that um, it almost takes bloodshed to reverse it or to stop it. And I don't know an answer to that, except if we could have educated them earlier, if we could discourage fundamentalism, if we could get rid of those pleas for money and prayer money and all this on Sunday, uh, TV services, and uh, I mean, they pull in people who are lonely or desperate or unseeing, unknowing of themselves. Somebody will save them. Somebody will do it for them. You know, um, mm -mm, not at all. But you can pay them. And that's what we do. You know? We surrender our life to be a soldier so we don't have to think. In fact, some people tell me, I like it because I don't have to think. Oh my God, <laughs> I can't, maybe my problem is I can't stop thinking. You know, and, uh, but I've found that a blessing so far. Yeah. Is there anything that, that you feel compelled to, uh, to share? I think I mentioned how a project like this also has its dangers. And that was what I wanted to come across, because I want to know that I'm participating in something that I don't think is glamorous or whatever, but I think it's important, and I also think, therefore, it's dangerous. But I like that kind of danger. And you can also look like an idiot and a fool, which I have happily been there many times, so I'm used to that, too. <laughs> well, don't you have to be looking like a fool. No, that's fine.